our studies of bringing John's chapter 8 of John's Gospel to a conclusion this evening. Um, we're bringing in, in verse 48, John chapter 8, verse 48. Eternal Lord to us 
Amen. And the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, who is full of grace and truth, a merciful, harmless, sinless, gentle, compassionate Savior, who came the first time into this world to save sinners, he came not to condemn, but he came to rescue, to reconcile, to redeem, he came to save, as the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. The Lord even wept over Jerusalem because in his foreknowledge, of course, he knew what was going to happen because of the rejection of him. And yet, despite his long suffering, his gentleness, the Lord Jesus had zero tolerance, which I've said many times from this pulpit, for false religious teachers spreading their poison as he confronted Satan's foes both at their dynamic and demonic and human level. Many times the demons of the Lord was heard and said they didn't want the Lord to cast them into the lake of fire there and then get Hannah. But on the human level, Satan's puppets, the false religious teachers, Jesus quickly exposed their hypocrisy and true spiritual condition. Jesus denounced them as hypocrites whose worship was in vain, futile, whose teaching was false, whose teaching was perverted, whose hearts were far from God, with their traditions and many laws in the Mishnah, they had made the word of God, the Old Testament, of none fact. This is what happens when anyone strays from the word of God by misplacing it with man's philosophies, ideas, rules, regulations, traditions, etc., etc., as well as misunderstanding, misrepresenting the word of God by taking it out of context. Jesus, on different occasions, accused them of being outwardly righteous but inwardly wicked. It was all external. It was all about reputation. But Jesus exposed them. He called them hard-hearted. He called them adulterers. He called them covetous. He called them prideful. But the Lord's judgment and condemnation reached its peak against these false religious teachers during Passion Week as he pronounced seven woes in Matthew 23, severe retributions on them as sons of hell. What an indictment. Their false teaching excluded others from God's kingdom. The blind leading the blind, and that's what false teaching does. Satan uses false teachers as instruments to deceive the multitudes in the banner of religion. They swore oaths, but did not keep them. They were diligent in tithing the miners, but ignored the important, the weighty things, aspects of the law. They outwardly observed the law, but inwardly were filled with wickedness. They appeared to be righteous on the outside, but in reality they were defied on the inside. They supposedly condemned the murders of the prophets, but at the same time their intention was to have the greatest prophet Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus confronted these false Jewish religious leaders head on as he had cleansed the temple twice, healed different people on the Sabbath, performed multiple miracles, spoke the truth with great precision and authority, gave them overwhelming evidence that he alone is and was the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Man, the promised Saviour, the promised Messiah, the eternal Son of God, which was a rebuke to them, but yet in their stubborn, prideful and hardness of heart, still would not 
Submit to his sayings. Believe as they were not his true sheep. We belong to the good shepherd as their ears, eyes, heart were still in darkness, not spiritually enlightened and made alive in Christ. Verse 47, he that is of God, hear of God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. This dialogue between Jesus and these Jewish religious leaders began on this occasion of the Feast of Tabernacles. The whole way back from verse 12 in John 8, six months before his crucifixion, which we have been zooming in, studying over the last roughly one and a half, two months. Jesus' indictment of them reached its climax in verse 44, which we looked at last week, where he openly declared they were children of Satan. The devil was their father as they practiced his deeds. In verse 44, it tells us, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. God's people, you see, a great indicator, a great spiritual indicator, a great spiritual test is God's true saints will consistently practice righteousness. Not all the time, there's times we slip up, we're not perfect until we get the glory, but nevertheless we should be walking in the light consistently, walking in faith, walking in love, walking in humility, walking in the spirit, walking in the vocation the Lord has called us to. The great spiritual indicator is that God's people who practice the things of God. They live the light of His word, they love righteousness, they love holiness. As Satan's children and the opposite, they love their sin. They love to continue on their sin. To bring this dialogue to a conclusion, this remarkable dialogue of the Feast of Tabernacles, the remainder of this chapter, we can pick out a number of headings here from the verses we've read this evening. First of all, we have the dishonor. The dishonor, these Pharisees, Sadducees, religious Jews, they dishonored Christ. And ultimately, that meant the dishonored God. Secondly, we have the doubting, how they doubted. They doubted unbelief in the book of Revelation towards the very end of it. Unbelief is the second category out of all those wicked categories who will be cast into the lake of fire. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And unbelief, doubt, if you doubt God's word, the unbelief, you'll never be saved. Thirdly, here we can pick out, towards the end of this chapter, is their defiance on Christ's disappearance, which was a miracle in itself. So first of all, here we have the dishonor. Verse 48 and 49. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Christ, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast killed and hast the devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. They're dishonor. For a Jew to be called a Samaritan was the grossest of insults. None was like to be insulted. But for a Jew to be called a Samaritan, it was the grossest of insults. But they did not stop there as they also charged Jesus of being demon possessed as well. These religious leaders could not attack, dismantle Jesus' statements, his words, so in return they attacked his person. They resorted to calling Jesus names as they could not refute his wisdom. The Jews labeled the Samaritans as physical and spiritual half-breeds, mongrels. The Samaritans were the descendants of the Jews who had remained in the northern kingdom. Don't forget Israel was split into two kingdoms. 
after Solomon, you had the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, and you had the southern kingdom, which consisted of Judah and Benjamin, where the temple, Solomon's temple, and the priesthood were there. It was the heartbeat of Judaism. And the Samaritans were the descendants of the Jews who had remained in the northern kingdom after its fall, God punished the northern kingdom first because of their idolatry, because of breaking the Sabbath, because of their sin and their rebellion. And as a result, God sent Elijah, Elisha, the prophets uh, of old to warn them in love as well as show them the word of God that they needed to repent and turn to the Lord, but they didn't, and as a result, God sent Sennacherib 722 BC in judgment, the Assyrian Empire against them, and as a result, the Northern Kingdom was brought into captivity, the siege, and it fell. And then they intermarried with the Gentile pagans transported there by the Assyrians. So the Jews labeled the Samaritans as physical and spiritual half-breeds, mongrels. They didn't get married with the Gentiles, with the pagan Gentiles. When the Jews came out of Babylon, the Samaritans put out the offer that they were willing to help the Jews rebuild the temple. The time of Zerubbabel and Ezra and so forth, but the Jews refused their offer and the Samaritans were then insulted. There was great bitter rivalry and friction intensified down through the centuries between the Samaritans and the Jews. And in Jesus' day, the animosity was so great that many Jews would refuse to travel through Samaria. But rather walk around the long way instead of through, through the straight way. Their journey would have been far shorter if they went through Samaria, but they insisted they wouldn't. Many of them, they went around the long way. They did not want to even put their foot in Samaria in case in their thinking and their self righteousness, of course, in their thinking that they would have got contaminated as they would shake off the dust of their feet. There was such bitterness, such venom between both factions and parties. But Jesus, of course, is no respecter of racial warriors. As he first revealed himself as Messiah to a Samaritan woman. By explaining the discourse of the living water as she went to get physical water. Jesus spoke to her about the living water which leads to eternal life by the spirit after the soul, in which this dear lady was converted, and others likewise, because in John 4 tells us, and many of the Samaritans of the city or the town it was believed in him, and many more believed because of his word. It was such a rebuke to the Jews. The Samaritans didn't have the privilege the Jews had. Christ only came through Samaria. And they believed, and yet Jesus was amongst his own people, the Jews, for three years, doing the miracles, casting out demons, feeding them, raising the dead. Power over nature, power over sin. Speaking the truth to them, and yet they did not believe. And he only came through this Samaria. And many believed on him, what a rebuke it was to these Jews. You see, the Lord moves on, folks. And as I mentioned this morning, when the gospel is diminished, if people don't want the gospel, if they don't want to know about Christ, the glorious Savior, the glorious gospel, which is the only source of setting someone free in the person of Jesus Christ, when they reject it and laugh at it and turn their back on it and can't push it out, then what happens to a nation? Then if the gospel is diminished, sin, Evil starts to increase more and more on people's lives or being more destroyed because of sin. But when the gospel through revivals is elevated, 
put in its right place, the prominent place, then sin and evil is more suppressed. And the Lord Jesus, you see, the Lord moves on. As he moved on from our nation, it seems like it at the moment, it come in great power, great, great power. In the 16th century, in the 17th century, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, the last great move was born in Scotland in 1949 to 53 in the Hebrides. The power of God come down. The people were on, their, on the streets crying for mercy. They were even in a nightclub. And the power of God came down in an evil, devil's den. The power of God, the convicted power of the Spirit, came amongst young people. The last thing in their minds was that meeting or that nightclub was, was God. But God came down in power. And they all left the nightclub and went to the church meeting to cry to God for mercy. That is God's power, folks. That's when God moves. But he moves on when people reject the gospel. And this is what has happened. This is the generation we're growing up in. That our generation, sad to say, have rejected the gospel. And as God moved on now to other nations, you see the Jews have rejected. The Lord went, of course, to the Samaritans here. And they believed as he spoke this great discourse of the living water to this woman, and others believed on him. Even Jesus' own brothers didn't even believe on him until after the resurrection. But Jesus also, in his teaching, on one other occasion, gave an illustration of a Samaritan being a good neighbor. So by calling Jesus a Samaritan, these religious Jews was in fact labeling him as a false teacher. As the Jews did not agree with the Samaritans' interpretation of the law, and also a traitor to Israel, they classed him as since he always, or since he had dealings with the Samaritans. But to knock the nail on the head, their false charges went one step further by claiming Jesus was possessed by a demon in verse 48 b. There are the Samaritan and has a devil. This is not the first time they have made this outrageous false allegation against Jesus. And yet the Lord was doing good to the people. He was feeding them. Feeding them. He was healing their sick. He was raising their dead. He was speaking the truth to them. And yet they had the audacity, the chick and the hardness of the heart to class Jesus of having a devil. The religious scribes accused him by being possessed by Beelzebub. As he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Later on in John's Gospel there was a division amongst the Jews. As many, John 10 says, many of them said, He had a devil and is mad. Why hear you him? People say the other day, why listen to the word of God? You're mad in the head. No difference. Why hear you him? I don't want to hear that nonsense. You're mad. He's not mad. That's what they think. They say he's seen the light of someone who's truly converted to the grace of God, transformed. To choose the perfect incarnate Son of God, the Holy One of Israel, the sinless one of being possessed of a demon and being demanded was an indication how, how furious they were and how sparsely blinded they were and how completely influenced they were under the control of the devil himself. Is it any wonder Jesus said to them in verse 44, You are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. Jesus could not have been demon possessed, it was impossible. Because no demon possessed person could possibly honor God the Father, as Jesus always honored and glorified his Father, as many a 
cut the times the Father hath spoken in the transfiguration. This is my beloved Son, and which I am well pleased. Hear you him at his baptism with John the Baptist. He says, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am pleased. Christ came, you see, he was the express image of the Father. He came to do the Father's will in its fullness, and he did complete it. And whom the Father was pleased, in verse 49 and 50, Jesus answered, after the accusation of being a Samaritan, and also a demon, Jesus answered, I have not a demon, a devil, but I honor my Father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. These religious Jews in their prideful self centeredness were seeking their own glory. It was all about reputation. It was all about looking to be honoured by men. And the Lord says, any person who is highly esteemed among men is an abomination. Christ didn't care about reputation. He didn't care about man's opinions or what he thought of them. The only thing the Lord was truly interested in was the glorified his Father. The Lord was not out to seek glory for himself or the praise of men. He was out to glorify his Father in which he did in his fullness and perfection. Jesus then brings him back in this dialogue to the vast importance to his words, the word of God. By applying them with the result of eternal life, verse 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, keep the word of God, he shall never see death. What a statement. God's people, you see, practice God's word. They delight in God's word. They're transformed, sanctified by God's Word. God's Word is the most precious item they can ever handle. And Jesus makes this massive statement here in verse 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Jesus was claiming to be sovereign over death. And which he is. Because Jesus is the living God. He is God manifested in the flesh. And as a result, as Jesus is Lord over death, sovereign over death, there was an indication here, before he actually mentioned it in verse 58, there was an indication that he is God. He is the great I am. He is the eternal God. The self-existent, self-sufficient one, all-powerful, eternal, creator God. In verse 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was I am. I'll explain that in a few minutes now. Jesus had previously declared this by inviting his audience to trust in him, his word being the bread of life, and that they would not experience spiritual death, but eternal life. In John 6, verse 47, the Lord had gave this great message. After feeding the 5,000 plus women and children, maybe 20,000 people, he done the miracle. But of course he done a miracle, not just the sake of doing a miracle. He done a miracle to point. There was a spiritual application in it. And then the Lord mentions about this great Statement, I am the bread of life. In verse, chapter 6, verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me, hath everlasting life. Christ is saying that you shall not die spiritually. You have the everlasting life. Verse 48 of chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Verse 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, and a man may eat thereof and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So for 
Christ to make this great statement. If a person keeps a sin, which is a great indicator, of course, someone's truly born of the Spirit, saved, he shall never see death. It's great to know, folks, if you're saved tonight, death is no pull. We should not fear death. Death is no pull over the believer. It can't contain us. Christ has already went before us. On death for the believer is victory. We are going straight into the immediate presence of the Lord. Folks, eternity is even more heightened reality than even on this earth at this present time. It'll be even more heightened consciousness. And while there you have eternal life in Christ in which you will not see spiritual death, or else the other alternative is you're under spiritual death. Christ has promised we will not see death, spiritual death. So these Jews were dishonoring God as Jesus was honoring his Father. Very right, quickly as we move on here, we have the doubting here. Leave the heart of unbelief, doubting. Verse 52 and 53 then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast an devil. Because he's mentioned, you'll never see death here. Abraham is dead. This is the example they give. And the prophets that thou sayest, if a man keepest my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? The thought they have fallen out here. And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? Once again, these religious leaders were spiritually blind, no spiritual insight to what Jesus was meaning. They were only on the physical. They brought Abraham back into the discussion. As Jesus, we looked at last week, had previously already dismantled their false hope of eternal life, thinking they were Abraham's physical, spiritual seed, which qualified them to be God's children. In their spiritual dullness, they thought Jesus was talking about physical death. As they gave an example of Abraham and the prophets, how they have already died. In other words, if the great Abraham did not have power over death, how dare you say you have power over death? In verse 52, if a man keep my sin, he shall never taste of death. How dare you say that? We revere Abraham. If great Abraham had died, surely you have to die. But they were in the physical. They didn't understand the spiritual application Jesus was meaning here. All along, Jesus was referring to spiritual life, eternal life, not physical. On one of the seven great I am statements, with great authority, the Lord proclaimed that I am the resurrection and the life after raising Lazarus from the dead. He that believeth in me, though he were dead physically, yet shall he live spiritually. Of course, you hear these false teachers read that verse out and they never ever expound it what it means. Especially in funeral services. They don't even expound it what it means. Approximately six months later, Jesus would show them he is the Lord over life and death. As he would die, of course, for our sins, be buried, and on the third day rise again. Christ is the resurrection of life. He was manifest to destroy the works of the devil with the power of death, in which he did. Death could not contain him. Christ tonight, folks, is the living Savior. He'll never die again. He lives in the power of an endless life. What an ultimate sacrifice it was. And he has conquered sin. He has conquered death. And he has conquered the devil. Hallelujah. Have you all assurance tonight of eternal life in Jesus Christ? 
I'll be honest, students, what Jesus meant here, you'll never see death, spiritual death. Because you're born of the Spirit, you have God's life within you. You have eternal life within you. But if you haven't received Christ, folks, repented and received Christ, you are still on the road to spiritual death, which is a horrendous place for the sinner who holds on to their sin. Call the lake of fire, Gehenna, hell. Calmly and patiently, Jesus then repeats the vital truth they had already stated in verses 49 and 50. He was telling them about his intimate, personal, eternal connection with the Father in whom he came to glorify. Verse 54 and 55. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. He didn't come to honor himself. He came to honor and glorify the Father. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet if you have known him, but I know him personally, you see. To be saved, folks, you may need to be in a personal relationship with a living God through the person of Jesus Christ. You must be connected to the true vine. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Yet in contrast with the rejection of him, the Lord told them, bringing them back to Abraham in verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. How did Abraham rejoice and see the Lord's day, his life and ministry on earth, when Abraham was born in 2166 BC? And entered into the land of Canaan 75 years later in 2091 BC. <coughs> that was 4,000 years ago, roughly. How did Abraham rejoice to see the Lord's day? It was the same way he saw the future city by faith. As Abraham walked by faith, trusting God, which was counted unto him for righteousness, he was known as the friend of God. During Abraham's pilgrimage, journey by faith, God did not give Abraham some special vision of Jesus' life and ministry, but the Lord did appear to him at times and gave him the spiritual perception to see these future events. God promised Abraham, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Genesis 18 was up me. It was through that and that's what happened. How could all the nations of the earth be blessed through Abraham? Because it was through Abraham's seed, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob had twelve sons which formed the twelve tribes of Israel, and through one of those tribes known as the line of the, the tribe and through the line of Judah, the Messiah would come from, who is known as the land from the tribe of Judah, especially when he returns in place and glory. Certainly Abraham received the parallelism in a sense recording the miraculous birth of his own son Isaac and the birth of the Messiah. Both were miraculous births. Abraham rejoiced to see the day of the Lord coming. Abraham saw Calvary when he offered Isaac as a sacrifice to God and yet believed God was able to raise him up his only son. He seen the parallelism too. In the priestly ministry of Melchizedek, Abraham could see the heavenly priesthood of the Lord as Christ, the great high priest, makes intercession for his people. In the marriage of Isaac, Abraham could see a picture of the marriage of the Lamb. I wonder are you going to the marriage of the Lamb? You see, it's only the bride of Christ are invited. And if you're not in Christ, you're shut out. These hard-hearted, prideful, religious Jews wanted to murder the very one in whose coming Abraham rejoiced them. 
in their stubbornness and their blindness and misunderstanding of Jesus' words. And the, the Jews replied to the Lord and shared with sarcasm here in verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? They were thinking only in the physical realm. Yes, no doubt Abraham had lived more than 3,000 years earlier on planet Earth, but they had twisted the Lord's words by saying that Jesus had seen Abraham. But in fact, the Lord had declared that Abraham had prophetically seen the Lord and rejoiced in it. They twisted it. The Lord didn't say he had seen Abraham. The Lord said Abraham had seen him. By faith, prophetically. In verse 58, Jesus now claims his full deity. By using the sacred name of God for himself, I am. In verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. What a monumental phrase. No higher, no greater. What did he mean? He says, I am the eternal. He was declared his divine. That he's divine, that he's God. I am the eternal one. I am the self-existent one. I am the self-sufficient one, meaning he existed before Abraham's time. It is ways and glory. The eternal Son of God, folks, has always been and always will be. He is co-existent with the Father and the Spirit, co-eternal. But in a act of human history and became man, but yet still God, 3,000 years ago. But before he had a human history, Christ knew all about Abraham, he's before Abraham, he's before Moses, before Adam, he's before everyone. He's eternal. Someone said by using the kindness I am rather than I was, Jesus conveyed not only the idea of existence prior to Abraham, but timelessness, the very nature of God himself, he is the eternal one. This was the same title God used to Moses at the burning bush. Which possibly could have been a pre-incarnate. Christ himself. To have discovered the dishonor, to have discovered the doubt, and finally here, the clue here with the defiance and disappearance, we've almost finished. The defiance and disappearance, verse 59, then took they up stones to cast at them. You see, in their law, if anyone declared to be God, they had to be, it was known as blasphemy. And that was, that was a capital sin, a capital offence, which was stoned to death. Then took they up stones to cast at them, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. These Jewish leaders now understood what Jesus claimed here when he says, I am. They realized that he was declaring that he is God. They realized he was declaring that he is God manifest in the flesh. They realized that he's declaring he is the Messiah. He is the eternal one before Abraham, before even all human beings, before this world was even created. He is the eternal one, the self-existent, self-sufficient one, the creator of the universe, the one who has existed before Abraham's time. And as a result, because of this, they were absolutely infuriated. How dare this one say, He is God? They were infuriated with such venom in their veins, with their intention to kill Him. They took the law into their own hands by picking up stones to throw them as they accused them of blasphemy. Their grip of unbelief was so powerful as they had made their minds up close to the irrefutable evidence of Jesus as the Messiah. They were, they were the ones who were really the blasphemers, yet in their shameful wrong judgment accused God manifest in the flesh 
Jesus Christ of blaspheme and God. The Lord had said enough for them. They were no state to listen, nor did he protest that they had misunderstood him. They were thinking of the physical instead of the spiritual. Supernaturally, Jesus would not allow himself to be harmed or killed, as his hour to die for sinners had not yet come. He performed another miracle here in verse 59 by passing through the midst of them. This dialogue was a close. Should have been a time of rejoicing for these Jews. Their Messiah was in the very midst of them. The words of God manifest in the flesh was given towards them. It should have been a time of rejoicing. It should have been a time of celebration. It should have been a time of hallelujahs, praise the Lord. But sadly it ended in tragedy. For greater judgment, greater condemnation for these religious Jewish leaders. Today, folks, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart. They have hardened their hearts to such a degree. As the Lord says, He that is of God, hear of God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I wonder, is your heart sensitive to the Spirit, to the Word of God tonight? Or have you hardened your heart? Today, if you will hear His voice, Harden not your heart. What a trust This dialogue should have been a time of rejoicing for these Jewish religious leaders. The words of eternal life was in their very midst. But sadly, they blew it. And their prideful arrogance on prideful, evil heart of unbelief in which greater judgment and condemnation was put forward for these religious Jewish leaders. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. I trust tonight you have an assurance that death has no hold on you. Folks, if you're not saved, it certainly has. It was a tower of princes in the Old Testament but praise God for the believer. We have eternal life. We have no fear of death. We're going to glory. But dear friends, if you're not saved, death is a horrendous thing. And especially spiritual death. This is why you need eternal life. This is why you need resurrection life. This is why you need to be born of God's spirit. It is the only way and it's through the person of Jesus Christ. Will you honour the Son tonight? Or are you still like these Jews, honouring your own sin? Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Is Christ's salvation having our folks? Is your sin? Unbelief will like a fire. I trust be wise. Trust in Christ. Receive him, repent, come by faith. He's the only source of salvation. He's the only source of eternal life. Praise his wonderful name. The Lord bless his words to us this evening. We'll just close our meeting by singing hymn number 288. Would you be free from your burden of sin? You see, Jesus had already spoken to these religious Jews earlier. We looked at a number of weeks ago. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. It's only Christ can truly set us free from our sin. And from the enemy. And from spiritual death. 
Would you be free from your spiritual sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you, O Regal of Victory, win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Verse 2, would you be free from your passion and pride? That was the problem, one of the problems with these religious Jews. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing of Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood.